After finishing her degree, she became a postdoc at ORNL and subsequently a staff member. And she continues to impress people as indicated by the uh, promotions she's received. Uh, she currently is serving there as the deputy director of the NG Arctic project, the lead investigator of the Fine Root Ecology Database and leader of below ground tasks component of a project known as Spruce. Uh, one of her big interests is communication. Colleen sees commu science communication as the foundation for a shared understanding of society's future. She has shared her scientific vision on Public Radio International Science Friday and in the Alan Alda School's Flame Challenge, as well as in organized symposia sessions and workshops like most scientists do. In 2019, she received the UT Patel Award for Science Communication, as well as the UT Patel Director's Award for Mission Support. Um, she is a member of the inaugural cohort of a program called New Voices at the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, which is uh, focused to a significant extent on uh, communication as well as uh, fostering leadership by young scientists. Uh, I won't go through the rest of the information that she sent in her bio and turn it over to her to tell us what she does and why it's important. Okay, first of all, I will, uh, I will get, uh, uh -huh. Colleen, I think you are now changed to be the host. Okay. Great, let me share. Make sure I'm not muted. And then let me say thank you, Ellen, for that lovely introduction. Um, and Ellen and Rich have both had sort of a front row seat to my career um, since I've been here. And I feel very lucky, lucky to have met both of them and to have gained the experience that they are willing to share with me. And also thanks to Herb and Carolyn for um, the lovely invitation to come and speak to you all today. Um, so just tuck in, everyone can see my first slide there. We're good. Okay. Yeah. Everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay. And okay. And as as Herb mentioned, um, if you have questions, do please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'm happy for you to ask them in person at the end. I usually don't mind if folks inter interrupt me while I'm speaking because that happens quite often here at the lab, but I think it's easier on Zoom to sort of wait until the end and sort of I'll have a little conversation. So um, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today about my research. I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour. Um, and as Herb mentioned, I am um, part of the Climate Change Science Institute here at ORNL, as well as part of the Environmental Sciences Division. Um, and as I was mentioning to, I think, Bob before we began, um, the Environmental Sciences Division split off into ESD and a Biosciences Division in recent decades. So some of the work that you all might have attributed to us before is now within the sort of molecular biology groups. So I wanted to tell you first about the Climate Change Science Institute, which was begun in 2009 and brings together several different divisions, biology, environmental sciences, computation, um, where we work to sort of advance our understanding of climate change and the impacts it has on human beings and natural systems. Um, as we all know, um, climate change is now a tangible reality and we've had extreme events and increasing um, extreme events like wildfires, hurricanes, Canes and flooding. Last year was the hottest year on record. Um, and so we have more than 130 folks that are part of the CCSI, and we're working to understand climate change in a lot of different arenas. So as you know, sort of climate change touches on many different kinds of science, which is why it's a national lab-worthy problem. Um, so thinking about or system modeling, data informatics and dissemination, integrative ecosystem science, which is the, the work that I do, which I'll share with you, thinking about impacts and adaptation, and now a new theme, which is thinking about pathways to net zero emissions. So if you wanted to find out more about CCSI, you could check out the website there. So as I mentioned, I am an ecosystem ecologist. That means I'm interested in understanding the cycling of carbon, nutrients, water, and energy among the living and non-living parts of the natural world. Um, and that um, involves a variety of tools and techniques that can be digging holes and filling them up again, but it can also be using advanced robot cameras to take pictures of when roots are born, how much they grow and when they die, or using things like stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen 
carbon to track carbon and nutrients throughout systems. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the tangling of roots with the surrounding soil. So this sort of my title alluded to the hidden world beneath our feet. Um, and that's because soils hold twice as much carbon as the atmosphere. So understanding what happens to carbon that's been stored in soils for a long time is important for thinking about potential feedbacks to the atmosphere, which could um, increase or accelerate the rate at which the globe is warming. And if you want to understand more about why we should stop treating soil like dirt, you could check out this TED Talk from my friend and colleague, Asmara Asifah Berhe, um, who has a, a really interesting perspective on the study of soils. Another reason I'm interested in understanding what's happening below ground is because not a lot of folks think about it. So when I'm out hiking around in the Smoky Mountains or on the Greenways in Oak Ridge, um, a lot of the folks that I hike with are looking up at the, the towering trees above and the leaves. Um, and I'm wondering what's happening below, beneath our feet. Um, so these tangling of roots with the soil, these roots that are tiny, that are narrower than this cord that's connecting my headphones to my computer, those are the roots that do all the work of acquisition of water and nutrients for the plant. So the big roots that you might trip over, those roots are holding the trees and the plants in place, but these tiny, tiny roots are the ones that are keeping the plants alive by gathering water and nutrients. Um, and they don't do it alone. So you can see in these three pictures that were taken by a robot camera buried in a bog in northern Minnesota, you can see roots in each of these pictures, but you can also see fuzzy fungi at the tips of each of these roots. And those fungi are called mycorrhizal fungi, and they actually assist roots and plants in taking up nutrients in exchange for carbon that the plants fix via photosynthesis. So there's a lot happening below ground that not a lot of folks think about, and it has implications for carbon storage and climate change. So the overarching question of my research program here at ORNL is how these interactions between plants and soils might change in response to changing environmental conditions. Um, and so today I wanted to take you on a little trip from squishy bogs to frozen tundra and everywhere in between to talk about the different places that I've worked and to talk about the different questions that we're attempting to answer in each of those places. This is one of my favorite maps of North America. I think it's meant to be concrete, but I like to think of it as different soils um, mapped out across North America. And I will map out for you sort of the past and the present of research that I've done since I've been at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, and I actually came here to work with Rich for my dissertation in 2004. Um, so I've got, have had the opportunity to learn about what the lab is doing for quite some time now. So beginning here in our backyard in East Tennessee with a temperate forest exposed to elevated carbon dioxide concentrations. Moving northward to Minnesota where we're working in a peatland, specifically a bog, which we've exposed to warming and elevated carbon dioxide concentrations. And then even further north to Alaska, where we don't have an experimental manipulation, but we're working across gradients in a place that is already rapidly changing in response to climate change. So starting here in our backyard and also in the past, um, with the free air CO2 enrichment experiment. So the photo of Rich there in the bottom left because Rich is the lead investigator of the FACE experiment, which began in 1998. And so um, we wanted to understand the response of the Eastern deciduous forest to rising atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. Because plants take up carbon dioxide via photosynthesis, the question was if there's more carbon dioxide in the air because of fossil fuel burning, would trees take up more carbon dioxide and use that to grow grow more. So that was sort of the overarching question of the experiment. But instead of looking at seedlings in a pot or saplings in a chamber and how extra carbon dioxide affected their growth, um, the novelty of this experiment was being able to look at mature forest trees in an intact soil profile for someone like me is very interested in that interaction between plants and soils. So you can see the two rings on the left there are 
are 25 meters in diameter and 18 meters tall, and they are exposing portions of this forest to extra carbon dioxide concentrations that we expected to see about mid-century. And then the two rings on the right are receiving ambient or current carbon dioxide concentrations, which have of course increased since 1998. They're currently more than 415 parts per million. Back then there were 380 parts per million. Um, and looking at over the course of 12 years, how elevated carbon dioxide affected forest growth, both above and below ground. And what we found was that elevated carbon dioxide did increase carbon uptake by the plants, but instead of growing more stem wood or growing taller or um, growing more leaves necessarily, most of the extra carbon fix went below ground to the production of roots. And not only were there more roots, there was more roots deeper in the soil profile as these trees attempted to acquire more nutrients now that they had more carbon to grow more tree biomass. But that had implications for how much nitrogen the plants could acquire, how much carbon was stored in the soil and ultimately whether or not this response to elevated carbon dioxide could be sustained over the 12 years of the experiment. So this is sort of um, a graph that encompasses what I've just told you sort of in one figure. And so if you look on the X axis, you can see the years of the experiment. And then if you look on the Y axis, you can look at the extra amount of carbon dioxide fixed into what we call net primary production, which is just the total amount of organic matter made by trees over a course of a year. And I have different colors for the carbon um, well, the biomass that went into the production of roots, wood, and leaves. And I've subtracted the production in ambient CO2 from elevated CO2, which means anything above zero was extra carbon fixed into biomass under elevated CO2. So you can see over the course of the experiment that the plants did take up more carbon and make more tree biomass, but where that carbon was allocated and the plant changed over time. So in the first year, most of the extra biomass or carbon fixed went to the production of wood, which had been an original hypothesis, I think, of the experiment. But increasingly over time, a lot of the extra carbon and biomass produced was in the fine roots, those roots that are responsible for water and nutrients and acquisition. But ultimately, by the end of the experiment, there was hardly any extra carbon or biomass produced under elevated CO2. So we sort of ended up with this vicious cycle of the trees had enough carbon, so now they needed more nitrogen, so they made more roots, but roots take a lot of nitrogen to make. And so ultimately, this response to elevated CO2 wasn't allowed to be sustained over time. But because there are more roots produced, this had implications for how much carbon was being input to the soil where it could potentially be stored for a long time. So one way to look at that again is looking at the x-axis here, years of the experiment. And on the y-axis here, I have four different soil depths and then the total amount of root biomass mortality or death of these roots that is input to the soil. The red color is elevated CO2 and so you can see at all soil depths and in total the cumulative amount of dead roots input to the soil was greater under elevated CO2 which means potentially an increase in the carbon input to the soil and potentially an increase in carbon storage in the soil. Another way that we were able to look at that was to use the C13 signature, a stable isotope of carbon, to figure out where carbon dioxide we'd added with the face apparatus was going. So since this carbon dioxide had already been combusted at a fertilizer plant, captured, liquefied, and brought to Oak Ridge. It was depleted in a stable isotope when we were able to measure that with a mass spectrometer. And so we were able to see throughout the soil profile the fraction of new carbon that we added that was the carbon at that soil depth and sort of which part of the carbon of the soil it was in. So palm is particulate organic matter and you can think of that as little decomposing bits of roots. And mom is mineral associated organic matter and that is sort of associated with the bacteria and the fungi that take up and eat that carbon for their um, metabolism. So you can see we're finding face derived carbon throughout the soil profile and the deeper that carbon is input to the soil, the higher it has a chance of staying there for a long time and not being returned or respired back to the atmosphere. <laughs> 
But I wanted to mention here that probably as I've been talking about roots, you're probably in your mind have a picture of the wrong kind of roots. So they're not the big woody roots like this ficus tree in Hawaii or the roots that you might trip over when you're walking around in the forest. These roots are tiny and short lived. So that's my hand, not to scale, obviously. So these roots are less than two millimeters in diameter, narrower than this cord. And they live for the span of a few months or a year. So you can see how making more of them and that they're so short lived could really contribute to the carbon that is being input to the soil and potentially stored there for a long time. I also wanted to mention that roots are so interesting because they have orders, much like streams have orders. So the most distal tips, the fingers of the roots, we call first order roots, kind of like first order streams that start up in mountains that join together to make second order roots, to make third order roots and so on, all less than, than this diameter. And as you change orders, you change things like anatomy, morphology, chemistry of these roots, which also changes their function. So the most distal roots are responsible responsible for water and nutrient acquisition. And the more proximal roots, the roots closer to the stem, are responsible for transporting that water and nutrient to the rest of the plant. Um, and so it led a colleague, Kurt Pregitzer, in 2002 to write in a scientific paper that the fine roots of perennial plants are a royal pain to study. Um, and that is true, um, of course, but it is a labor of love. So then I wanted to move us sort of forward into the future. The FACE experiment ended in 2009, um, and then we began a new experiment in northern Minnesota where the Department of Energy, who funds all of the work that I'm talking about today, um, asked us to move from a single factor climate manipulation, which was elevated carbon dioxide, to something that included multi-factors. So we know that extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is contributing to global warming. So what happens if you provide extra carbon dioxide and you warm up an ecosystem? What are the responses in that case? And so this is the SPRUCE experiment, which because government agency funded, we have an acronym, of course, so SPRUCE and peatland responses under changing environments. Um, and this is led by Paul Hansen there, um, his photo in the corner, and the treatments began in 2015 and are expected to run for a decade. And um, that's one reason I really, really like to be at a national laboratory, the sort of this investment in long term experiments where we can really understand changes from year to year and over the course of a decade is really important for thinking about long-lived plants like trees or um, important ecosystems like bogs. So the spruce experiment is in a peatland, which is a kind of wetland, and specifically it's in a bog. So um, peatlands are important because they only cover 3% of the global land surface, but they store more than a third of terrestrial soil carbon in deep deposits of peat. And in this particular peatland, the carbon there is more than three meters deep and has been accumulating for 11,000 years since the glaciers receded and scraped out parts of the landscape that filled in with aquatic plants and sort of you end up with all this carbon stored because it is cold and wet and acidic and decomposition is very slow. So you get this accumulation of carbon and so you can see if it's been protected from decomposition all of these 11,000 years by cold wet conditions what happens when you warm it up and dry it out is an important question because there's so much carbon there. So that is the question we're asking at Spruce. Um, and another big perk of being in a national laboratory is being able to leverage the technology development here. So new technology was developed to warm up this ecosystem. So above ground, we have these 12 meter diameter, seven meter tall chambers that are circulating forced hot air that's heated with propane. And then below ground, we have heating rods that encircle each plot that heat up the soil from zero to three meters um, and then in the middle of the plot just from two to three meters so for folks like me interested in that plant soil interface you don't get any hot spots in the rooting zone you just have this nice volume of warmed peat and since these are wet areas we actually have seawall that surrounds each plot to make sure that we keep the treatment constrained to each of those plots so if we dry out this plot we want it to stay dry and not be sort of flooded with water from the surrounding areas. <laughs> 
So this is what it looks like from the air. So you can see in the upper corner here, this is a real door. So you can sort of get an idea of how large these chambers are. And they had to be large so they could encircle little mini box. We wanted to understand the ecosystem scale responses. So we have 10 of these enclosures in Northern Minnesota, and we are warming them up in what we call a regression design. So instead of just heating some and not heating others, we wanted to look at different levels of warming to see whether there were thresholds and how the ecosystem systems might respond. So we have this gradient of warming. This plot receives no warming, but it has the walls, which of course warm it up a little bit, all the way up to this plot here that receives plus nine degrees Celsius hot air all day, all night, all year round, 16 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than its surroundings. And then we have that gradient of warming repeated with extra carbon dioxide. And here the extra carbon dioxide is targeted at 900 parts per million, which is twice as much as what we currently have, um, but could possibly be expected in a century or so. And really we just wanted to see how it modified the response of the ecosystems to warming. So um, I've told you a little bit about my interest in my work below ground. And so really, um, this is a new system to think about some of these things. So instead of sort of the sand, silt, and clay of our backyard here in Tennessee, we're thinking about saturated soil that is made up of dead plant material that's accumulated for 11,000 years. So very different. Um, and I like to show folks this picture because it's sort of a picture of what's happening below ground in a bog where this big sort of yellow um, material here is a moss, which is the main carpet, um, the main plant that carpets the ground, sphagnum moss. And that also when it dies becomes the soil. So this dead and decaying moss um, is being wrapped up and hugged by this root of an ericaceous plant, which are in the blueberry family. They like to live in nutrient poor acidic environments like bogs. So this is sort of what the soil, the plant soil interface environment looks like in a bog, which is interesting and different. Um, so before we even started looking at the effects of warming on what's happening below ground and the spruce experiment, we wanted to understand where the roots are and the soil profile in a system that's so different. So let me walk you through this graph. And I wanted to point out Joanne and John who have really helped with all of the root measurements that we make in this system. So this graph is split into two sides. One side is a hummock and the other side is a hollow. And that's because bogs have this sort of undulating surface where hummocks are raised and hollows are depressed a little closer to the water table level. And the water table level is this light blue. So you can see it's very close to the surface. Here in the hollow, it's only 10 centimeters below the surface of the hollow. In the hummocks, which are a little higher and drier, it's about 30 centimeters below the hummock surface. And then in dark blue and on the y-axis, we have depth. And so we have on the x-axis the amount of shrub root biomass. So the little roots that I just showed you hugging the sphagnum, we wanted to find out where they were in the soil profile. We expected, since they can't breathe underwater like some aquatic plants can, that we would find them above the water table level. Now you can see from this graph that that wasn't the case. We were very surprised to find perfectly intact and preserved shrub roots all the way down at 175 centimeters depth, all the way down below the water table level. But when we um, measured the C14 in them, which allowed us to understand how old they were, those roots were dead, perfectly preserved, roots with a carbon age of 5,000 years or more. So I don't know if you've all heard of bog bodies that they find perfectly preserved in bogs in Europe. The same thing was happening here. These roots, when they died, were not decomposing. They were just being coming part of this accumulated carbon material in the in the peat. And the roots that were alive fit our expectations. So here you can see at the surface, the carbon age of 10 years or less, those roots above the water table level were alive. So we found that roots of the system are very shallowly distributed. Now, then we wanted to understand what warming did to roots. And so we found that warming strongly increased the growth of those tiny shrub roots that I showed you but it was not enough to increase carbon accumulation in the bogs. So bogs have been accumulating carbon for these 11,000 years, but warming puts an end to that. 
So first, let me show you the root response. So there are a couple of ways to think about what the roots are doing. And my postdocs, Avni Malhotra and Camille Dufresne, um, looked at a couple of different ways to measure what roots are doing. One way is to look at how much they grow. And so you can see here, these graphs are years, 14, 15, 16, 17. We started warming and elevated CO2. And the upper graphs are looking at soil moisture, but backwards. So left to right is getting drier. And the bottom graphs are looking at soil temperature. So left to right is getting warmer. So you can see the treatments are essentially warming up and drying out the soil that these roots are growing in. And root growth strongly increases in response to warming. So you can see that here. And that's both in elevated CO2 and ambient CO2 in hummocks and hollows. But if we put those data together with all of the other carbon parts of the ecosystem, so how much are leaves growing and stem wood and, and the mosses and how much carbon is being released from the soil as carbon dioxide and methane, what we find is as you increase mean annual temperature here on the x-axis, um, you lose carbon. So this net carbon exchange, anything negative means that carbon is being lost from the ecosystem. So basically, warming into the future will turn bogs from this circle, which is they're accumulating carbon, in some cases like our bog for 11,000 years, to bogs that potentially lose carbon to the atmosphere, which contributes to global warming because that carbon is lost as carbon dioxide or methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. This paper was led by Paul. So moving even further northward now to Alaska. So one of the cool things, as I mentioned about being at a national lab is getting to build a range of possible features. So building the face experiment or building the spruce experiment, features that we don't have now, but that we can build to see how ecosystems respond to them. Or also in our work across Alaska, Alaska is warming two to three times faster than the rest of the world um, because of what we call Arctic amplification as the, um, the ice on the water um, melts, you get this dark water absorbing heat and so it's warming faster there. Um, so we're looking at changes occurring there already. Um, and so um, as part of the NG Arctic experiment, which is next generation ecosystem experiments in the Arctic, which is land by, led by Stan Wolschleger. Um, I just became the deputy director of this project in the last year and it has been awesome to sort of see all the behind the scenes decisions made and the, and the leadership that goes into leading 150 people spread across four national laboratories and the University of Alaska Fairbanks, looking at six different science questions. So we're trying to understand things from greenhouse gas production and, and polygonal tundra to slump and thermocarst events that are occurring here or to fires that are occurring because lightning strikes are increasing or to the march of these dark shrubs across the tundra, um, which changes the reflection and the heat absorption by the system. So measuring all of these things together to really get a landscape level view that helps us and also computer models predict what the future might hold. So here's a picture I like to um, show folks um, from a boardwalk in Utqiagvik, Alaska on the Barrow Environmental Observatory. Um, it's the northernmost place um, in the United States, used to be called Barrow, Alaska, changed their name in 2016 to Utqiagvik, which I like because it means a place to gather wild roots, <laughs> which I appreciated. Um, and you can think that, you know, maybe for a plant ecologist like myself, it might be kind of boring to maybe work on the Arctic tundra which by definition doesn't have any trees in it. Um, but that's just because you need to look a little closer. And so you can see um, that actually the, the condition of the system like tundra, which is underlain by giant ice wedges and permafrost, you can actually see that on the landscape. So these dark lines here are where the ice wedges underlie um, the, the land. And so the, the freezing and cracking of soil over time, water gets in, it freezes, it makes a bigger crack, you end up with a big ice wedge. And that means that water can't drain. So it pools there on the surface, which means it's wetter, which means you get different plant communities, different soil carbon storage. And you can actually see these, what we call polygons from space. So if we understand what's happening on these polygons, it's possible that we can use things like uncrewed aerial vehicles or airplanes or satellites to predict these things further across the landscape than we could walk in our tundra boots. <laughs> 
And for the sorts of things that I'm interested as one of these 150 people fanning out across the Arctic to measure things are what's happening below ground, of course. So some tundra plant species actually have five times as much biomass below ground as they do above ground. And so you can imagine in the harsh environmental conditions of a, of a system like um, Ukiagvik, Alaska, where the plants are actually sort of hugging the ground surface to avoid the harsh conditions above ground a lot of biomass below ground to take up water and nutrients, but also to store carbon and nutrients that you need to grow again the next year in this harsh system, that that might be a good strategy for plants to take. Um, but also that many plants have many different strategies for coping with systems like this. So what we've been finding is that across the tundra, um, plants have different strategies both above and below ground for coping with these changing environmental conditions across short distances of the polygons, and then of course over time as things are getting warmer. So one way to look at that are to look at these three different species, which are in the picture I showed you. So the two species here on the left are sedges, um, so sort of aquatic plants. And But even though they're both the same type of plant, they have different strategies. You can see here, Carex likes to make a lot of roots and likes to dip their toes pretty far into what we call the active layer. So because tundra is underlain by permafrost, which is soil that has been permanently frozen for millennia, these plants only have a shallow amount of soil that thaws each year for them to grow into. And so where we were here um, on the Barrow Environmental Observatory, I can actually touch the frozen soil if I stick my arm down to the elbow. So it's only 30 centimeters or so below the surface. So these plants only have 30 centimeters or so each year of soil that thaws enough for them to grow into, and then it refreezes each winter. Um, the middle plant here also a sedge just makes a few roots, um, but also dips their toes pretty close to the permafrost boundary that has really, really high rates of nutrient acquisition. So it doesn't need many roots. The third plant here is um, the tallest woody plant <laughs> um, outside of Kyagvik, Alaska, this tiny, it's actually a willow shrub. Um, and it has, you can see very shallow roots, but you, if you look closely, you can see these little black tips on the roots. So this is the mycorrhizal fungi that I was telling you about earlier. So the, um, this plant makes um, this symbiotic, this partnership with mycorrhizae to assist it in acquiring water and nutrients. So one way to sort of look at that um, with data are to dig holes, of course, and to look at the rooting depth distribution. So these orange lines um, are for each of the three species I just showed you looking at where the roots are in a soil profile. So fraction of living roots on the x-axis here and then soil depth or layer. So an organic layer, a mineral layer, and then the permanently frozen soil layer. And you can see the um, two sedges tend to keep their roots sort of at the soil surface, but also grow deeply towards the permafrost layer. But this shrub that I showed you only has living roots just in the organic layer at the very surface there. So then what we did is we added a stable isotope of nitrogen to these different soil layers, some in the organic layer, some in the mineral layer, and some in the permafrost layer to look at does where plants are acquiring nitrogen from in the soil match their rooting depth distribution? Can we use the rooting depth distribution to predict where plants are getting their nitrogen from? And we found that we really can't. So actually these two sedges, even though they have a lot of roots in the surface, they're getting most of their nitrogen from this middle soil layer, not at the surface. Whereas you can use rooting depth distribution to predict where this shrub is getting its nutrients from. So all at the soil surface. And we did a little modeling analysis and we found that because shrubs associated with this mycorrhizal fungi, they were able to compete with bacteria and fungi at the surface to get these nutrients. These sedges don't have that partnership. So they were not competitive here at the surface with these bacteria and fungi that were taking up nutrients. So they had to get their nutrients from this middle layer. Um, and we did find that these deeper roots were able to get some nutrients from the permafrost boundary. So as permafrost thaws, that active layer will become deeper. And so it's only the deeply rooted plants that will be able to ex access that new nitrogen. So their strategy might be going for deeper nitrogen, where the shrub strategy might be going for really competitive at the soil surface, which is interesting. We also work further southward on the Seward Peninsula, which is a little peninsula that 
that sticks out, juts out to the west there off the coast of Alaska, um, and looking at how models represent what plants are doing in the tundra. So this is work done by colleagues Ben Solman and Verity Salmon, and these large models that sort of predict into the future for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, what the climate might be in 50 years or 100 years, have to represent the entirety of the land surface, including the Arctic tundra. And one way that it, they represent the Arctic tundra is by assuming that it's covered with grasses and shrubs. But what we find on these hill slopes further south in Alaska is there are many different kinds of plants there and that the model needs all of these different kinds of plants in order to be able to accurately represent carbon cycling out across the tundra. And so we've worked to include and measure these different kinds of plant species in the tundra so that we can represent the carbon cycling better um, today and also in the future. And also as part of this project that includes 150 folks in working in remote field sites, we've worked really hard within the project to develop this culture of safety and trust. So sharing our data with modelers, bringing modelers to the field, collaborating across five institutions. Um, the project's been going on for more than 10 years now, and so it's been really great to be part of it since the beginning as we learn how to better collaborate, which I think means better science for all of us as well. So I've showed you three places that I work in the world, um, but these are just three places and we want to understand what is happening across the world. In particular, I want to understand what's happening below ground across the world. And so because I just showed you that models need to understand what's happening with more than just a few plant species, we wanted to gather all the data from across the world to understand what root characteristics look like for different plants across the world. And so we put together fresh and that was with my colleagues Luke McCormick and Schaefer Powell um, and gathered 300 different kinds of root characteristics from more than a thousand species from multiple data sources across the world and we put out FRED, the Fine Root Ecology Database in 2017. Um, Schaefer, who built a lot of it with data from the literature, wanted to call it the Fantastic Root Ecology Database, but we didn't think that would be publishable. Reviewer number two wouldn't let that by and so we changed that to Fine Root because Fine Roots are the roots that are less than two millimeters in diameter. FRED is now the largest root trait database in the world with 300 different ways of thinking about what roots are doing with observations from across the world. Um, and we actually just released FRED version three last March. So it has sort of a lot more data from a lot more species. Um, and it was very important to us and something that's important to me in general is the research that we do is funded by taxpayer dollars. And so that research should be publicly available for folks to download for free it should be accessible and so these are not my data these are our data and so you can come and download if you're interested any type of root data that you might like to better understand the world and we've got folks who use FRED to sort of supplement measurements they make in one place to compare and then we also have modelers who use FRED to better parameterize or test their models of the entirety of the land surface which is exciting. But like any database, FRED is sort of what we call a sparse matrix. So we have a lot of traits, but not much information on any one of them in particular, right? Um, and there's some we have more information than others and some places in the world we have more information. So this is a map of the information in FRED 3. Um, and this is just climate classifications from what we call the Kopp and Geiger map. And you can see a lot of our data is green. So it comes from the temperate zone where a lot of scientists in the US and Europe have been working for many, many decades. We have less information from places like the tundra and also the tropics. And then in terms of the kind of root traits we're thinking about, we have a lot of information on the root system. So that's the information you get when you dig a hole, look at how many roots are there, you know, quantify them or look at how deeply they're distributed. But we have less information on anatomy where you have to actually cut roots open and look at their um, anatomical features, less information on physiology, so difficult to measure root physiology because you have to separate it from the surrounding soil. And once you do that, sort of the inference that you get from that is tricky to think about. So these are um, areas for future sort of research, which uh, is nice also to think about, not just what we have, but what we need.
So we've got a little work to do, but as long as we keep our eyes on the ultimate prize here, which is world domination of sort of understanding what roots are doing across the world so that we can better predict the future and models, I think is sort of the dream and the career's worth of, of research to do. Um, and so I wanted to thank, as I mentioned, the Department of Energy funds the research that I told you about today, and specifically it's the Biological and Environmental Research Program that funds funded FACE and funds Spruce and NGArctic and FRED. And, you know, my name was the only name on the first slide, but of course, one of the great things about doing science is you get to meet a lot of amazing people and collaborate with them on projects and write papers with them. And I've been very lucky to have a lot of amazing collaborators and co-authors over the years, including Rich, who's on the call. So thank you for listening. Oh, and I also wanted to mention um, Ornell has a new podcast series. So you can actually hear about Fred Spruce and NG Arctic on Ornell's podcast if you haven't already, The Sound of Science. So you can hear the actual scientists sort of geeking out about their own research on those if you're interested. So thanks for listening and I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Colleen. That was quite interesting. Um, we see uh, we have one question from David Fields, which reads, thanks for a nice presentation, lots to consider. Might one increase the biomass storage as peat, uh, as peat by providing more nitrogen or by genetically modifying the plants, especially line roots function, so that so their shallow roots fit, fix uh, atmospheric nitrogen. Yeah, great question, David, thank you. Um, so we have colleagues in the biosciences division that are thinking about genetically modifying poplar plants actually for that same reason. So modifying um, the plants so they, or, well, choosing modified plants that have a higher root to shoot ratio, for example, or a higher amount of lignin in their roots to slow that decomposition. Um, and I think Rich would say, um, if you're answering that, it's important to think about that moss that I mentioned. So moss, um, I don't study because they don't have roots, but but Rich has studied in the spruce bog, and there's actually nitrogen fixers, nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the moss that fix atmospheric nitrogen and contribute nitrogen to the system that way. So thinking about that interaction and how it changes with warming has been so interesting. I don't see any other uh, questions in chat. Uh, Colleen, I realize you and your colleagues have been performing uh, basic research that's, that's as yet uh, not fully complete, but that, uh, but that usually leads to, uh, to applic it, it rarely leads to applications quickly. Um, so I'm wondering um, how your research results have, have been you've in incorporated in current computer climate, climate models and, and any other ways that it, it's Im impacted climate research. You, you've, you've mentioned that a little bit in your talk. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so I think what I like to say is one of the reasons why I really like to work at, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory within the Climate Change Science Institute is in any academic institution, I would be the ecosystem ecologist. Like I would be the person who understands and studies carbon and nutrients. But here at ORNL, I'm the person who, who studies roots because we're all ecosystem ecologists. So we're all measuring one piece of a very large puzzle. And the way that that understanding makes a difference is by putting it into these climate models. So climate models include a land surface, an atmosphere, and an ocean, and now a cryosphere as well. Um, and so making sure that those models are getting it right today helps us to better be confident in predictions these models might make for the climate of the future. And so those predictions these models are making for the next 50 or 100 years, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just released their sixth report, you can read that, you can read the policy summary, is, is all based on model understanding. And so really, I think the work that we do is important to make sure that we can trust what these models are predicting for our future, because that, 
range of predictions that the models make can help society to make better decisions today. And I think that that's a national worthy, a national lab worthy endeavor is to sort of provide the information that can help to guide um, or be a foundation for, for society decisions. Thank you. Any more questions? Question, Colleen. Colleen, yes. is there, uh, if you could choose what needed to be done next to address uh, some significant unanswered issues and the things you're working on, what would you, where would you be doing research? What would you be looking for? It's a great question. We just had a big workshop on this because we're sort of starting to think about the future. So, you know, it's been so awesome to be in the environmental sciences division sort of standing on the shoulders of folks like Virginia and Rich and Ellen and and the work that they've done to advance our understanding of the natural world and this progression right from small experiments to big experiments to big experiments in new places in the world and I would say what we've been discussing is that a lot of this understanding comes from natural ecosystems undisturbed places in the world but really humanity is is making a, a fingerprint or a footprint on the world. We have disturbances like flooding or fires or or tree falls or or the or you know frost storms or freeze events and ice storms and and so thinking about the interplay between disturbances like wildfire and warming and some of these typical traditional experiments that we do, I think is sort of the next horizon for us. So does disturbance affect the way that the ecosystems respond to warming? Does warming modify how ecosystems would respond to a disturbance like wildfire? I think those are some of the questions that we're thinking about. Any more questions? David? I think I see yeah. David's hand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks, Kelly. Yeah. And I, I like Ellen's question about so getting more data. And I know you're thinking about this. I have a question about the way we do science. And I think. You know, there are a couple of ways. We get in the laboratory, we create situations, or we go out and systematically measure a lot of things on uh, selected plots, selected environments. But we are at a, at a crisis point, I think, of needing to, to answer some questions about how we might sequester more carbon. And nature is, is so diverse. It's performing experiments all the time. And there's such diversity as you go from plot to plot, place to place. So I wonder if it might be possible to design an experiment which would measure uh, certain key indicators that these places are of special interest and get that out to, uh, to high schools or to, uh, to collaborating groups. Mm -hmm. For example, you might probe around in, in peat production areas mm -hmm. and say, is this area especially good at uh, sequestering carbon? Or is this area especially good at uh, harvesting atmospheric nitrogen? a small kit that could be distributed. So you'd have a huge database. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and something that we're thinking about a lot here. I, I think the, I, the idea of the citizen science component of your question is so interesting. And I think that that's an area we haven't necessarily tapped yet through the National Laboratory, but lots of other folks um, are, are doing that. Um, and then in terms of which places store the most carbon, that's something that we think about a lot. So one of the reasons why the Department of Energy wanted us to leave our backyard in East Tennessee was in part because we've done a lot of research here and we understand deciduous forests pretty well, but also because the areas that they They've sent us to bogs and the tundra store tons and tons of carbon either in frozen soil or soil that's very wet and so thinking about that capacity is something we do think about um, i have colleagues here who are thinking about mapping places um, based on their vulnerability and importance so thinking about these places store a lot of carbon are they particularly vulnerable to climate change like it seems bogs are in particular um, and that sort of thing and then i have folks thinking about what happens happens if we reach our political goal of um you know, net zero, for example, and we begin to draw down carbon from the atmosphere, how does that the backwards pathway affect what natural ecosystems are doing, right? Is there going to be this big release shoop, of carbon back to the atmosphere? Those are questions as well. I like to I like to think of that as the other side, the questions. That'd be great to get to that other side and think about those questions, right? Oh, and we have a question from Carolyn Krauss. What, uh, what all do you mean by nutrients? Mm 
what is the role of nitrogen? Yeah, great question. So um, just like us, plants aren't made of just carbon. So we are made of carbon and water, but also nutrients that we need to survive. And it's the same for plants. So when we think about um, the way that we think about it for plants is what limits their growth, right? So can they keep growing if they don't have enough carbon? Can they keep growing if they don't have enough nitrogen or phosphorus, for example? So once you give them enough carbon with extra CO2, what becomes the next thing that will limit how much they can grow? And for us in the sweet gum plantation, it was how much nitrogen was available for them to make more biomass, more more material. Um, there's research done that different plant species in different parts of the world are limited by the availability of different nutrients. So for example, here in the temperate world where we are, nitrogen is often the limiting nutrient, which is why David asked about atmospheric nitrogen fixation. That's how it gets added to the systems. In places like the tropics, which have very old soil, um, the, the rock that phosphorus comes from um, has eroded and degraded over time. So phosphorus is the nutrient that tends to limit the production of tropical trees, for example. And then of course, we think less about the other important things like magnesium and calcium and all those things as well that are important for plant growth. Um, and it used to be these models that we've been talking about uh, didn't include nitrogen in the model. So it was just a model of carbon because that's what they wanted to understand. It turns out if you don't include nitrogen and the feedbacks that come from that and the interaction with the carbon cycle, you don't get the right answers because they just had plants growing a lot more because there was more carbon, but plants aren't made of just carbon. They also need nitrogen to survive. Does that help? Uh, we have a question from uh, Eve Angstrom. It is virtually every talk I've heard related to global warming has shown positive feedback with respect to atmospheric CO2. Are we doomed or are we missing some negative feedback that has historically stabilized climate? Um, I don't think we're doomed. Um, I think that things are out of whack, right? So the historical part of your question is things were pretty much in balance, right? Over millennia, hundreds of thousands of years. And what we've done by burning fossil fuels is rapidly change the balance, right? And so it's really that deforestation, the burning of fossil fuels, contributing atmospheric carbon to the atmosphere really quickly that is the problem. So if we stop that, um, then things have a chance to get back into balance. And so I think it's just, it's the time frame and, and the balance that we're talking about and, and how and what it will take to get back to that balance. Um, I will say also, and I think Rich was involved in some of this, there's talk about geoengineering. So the sort of, we've gotten into such a bad situation that do we need to put particles in the atmosphere or a giant line to block the sun or something like that. And of course, there's problems with that, both sort of ethically and scientifically, of course. But really what it's talking about is the balance, right? We've changed one thing drastically. Do we need a drastic change to, to, to get back to the balance that we need? Uh, Colleen, we have a question from uh, Sid Ball. It is, I've heard of potential tipping point where a lot of methane appears quickly. Mm -hmm. Is this related to what you are studying? A little bit. So um, one of the reasons people mention methane is because it's in addition to carbon dioxide, methane is also an important greenhouse gas and it actually has more than 35 times the warming potential of, of carbon dioxide over a given time frame. Um, we don't study sort of rapid release of methane, but we do study methane. And so methane is what happens um, when soil organic matter, when carbon containing material in the soil is decomposed under conditions with no oxygen. So you end up instead of microbes, like we respire carbon dioxide, microbes, bacteria and fungi also respire carbon dioxide, unless they're the kind of microbe that is 
lives in oxygen free environments and then they're respiring methane. And so where we see methane released into the atmosphere is in wet places like in bogs, like in the Arctic tundra where the water is pooled above the permafrost or these ice wedges. And so we do see that if things get wetter in the future, you'll get more methane released. And so that's something the models will need to get right to not just how bacterial and fungi um, and plant activity changes with warming, but whether it's um, under oxic or, or anoxic conditions. So that's something we think about. And um, we have been hearing a lot in the news about these big methane sort of releases. Um, and I'll say every year there's technology being developed that allows us to better track smaller scale shorter time frame releases of methane. And we do have um, a tower in, outside of Utkiagvik that measures from the air the mixture of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere. And now improved technology lets us see that there are sort of burps of methane in the early spring that had been stored under frozen ground for the winter, which is interesting and things that, that we hadn't been able to measure before, so. I see that the Chuck Coutant has something to say. He's muted, Chuck. Okay, sorry, let me unmute. Uh, Colleen, a lot of, of the world has agriculture rather than uh, natural systems. A lot of it rather monoculture, rice, wheat, corn. To your knowledge, is anybody doing the similar sort of thing that you are only under these agricultural conditions? Yes, sir. Lots of folks are. So um, there is an, a face experiment with um, soybean, for example, in Illinois. Um, there's folks that have been doing warming experiments with rice over in China. And again, methane is a very important component of that work as well. And, and there's um, colleagues in parallel that are measuring root characteristics of agricultural plants and thinking about what different crop types mean for carbon storage throughout the soil profile, right? So the sort of more to native um, plants, deep, more roots, deeper soil carbon and that sort of thing. Um, and I know Virginia did some of this, this work modeling the implications of that when she was at the lab. Um, so yes, there are folks doing that. That's not what I do, but it is of course important to understand the context of that as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. What other questions or comments? Well, I don't, uh, I don't see any more. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess what we should do is all uh, unmute yourselves and and thank uh, Colleen for a, for a very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening, everyone. Nice to see thank all you. your faces. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I would say that uh, I just remind uh, everyone that uh, uh, next week. Uh, or ne next month, rather, uh, that uh, uh, we will have a, a hybrid meeting uh, on May the 10th uh, to hear Bonnie Carroll speak about formation and experience of information international associates, which, which she started. Um, so with that, we, you will hear more about that uh, uh, in the announcement for, for May 10th which will be our normal second Tuesday of, of the month. We just changed this month uh, for, for the purpose of, uh, of uh, Friday being uh, Earth Day. So I declare the meeting adjourned. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Herb.